All right, let's kick it to RJ. Great stuff from him discussing this massive ranking, uh, a bit just beyond the AP poll reaction that we had the other day. So here's RJ. I'm now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is Fox Sports' RJ Young. Uh, RJ, your ranking of all 134 FBS teams, it is officially out on FoxSports.com. If you want to follow along with this conversation, you're listening to it, you're watching us on YouTube, first of all, thank you. But the Fox Sports College Football Twitter has it as the, the pinned tweet, so you can see it there. I got a ton that I want to get to with you, but let's start with the obvious here. Um, it's the thing that when you agreed to come on to this particular show, it's probably the thing that you knew I was going to ask about. Akron's only at number 132. Like, do you not have any faith in Joe Moorhead? What's up? <laughs> Look here. Uh, I'll put it this way. The first time that somebody comes to me about Akron, I will let you know, Connor. I will let you, you know. just did. I well, no, 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 no. You're coming to me. Somebody <laughs> else out in the wilderness. In the wilderness, like I get in the wilderness, I get, I get squirrelies, right? I've got Nevada. I've got New Mexico State. I've got Liberty. I've got Jacksonville State, but nobody's had a damn thing to say to me about Akron until right now. So, I mean, if you want to turn this show into an Akron podcast, we can do it. But I would just start with this. Joe needs a quarterback. I know. I know. I, we can keep going, but I'm not – I don't – look, I, it's, it's August. I try to give people hope, and you already here got me talking about what I'm worried about with, Ak with Akron – with the Akron Zips. Come RJ, on, you're good. RJ, you're good. I, I think even Joe would admit he's a very honest person. I think even he would admit he doesn't have a top 130 team yet in FBS. So we're, we're good there. We can move past that. Uh, okay, so here's your top 10. You have Mizzou at 10, Alabama at 9, Michigan at 8, LSU at 7, Ole Miss at 6, Florida State 5, Oregon 4, Texas 3, Georgia 2, and Ohio State at 1. Before someone says that you are anti-SEC for just the, the Ohio State-Georgia thing with 1-2, you do have Oklahoma at 11, Tennessee at 13, which means that you have half of the SEC in your top 13. But explain your rationale for the, the, the decision to have Ohio State at 1 instead of Georgia. So we start this thing uh, because it, it lives, it breathes, it's fluid, right? I don't believe in predicting a finish with a preseason ranking. That's ridiculous. Amen. So it's just, just stupid. I don't know what we're doing with that. So what we start with is who do I think has the best opportunity to win the national championship in 2024? And then we work down. Okay. The reason that I got Ohio state at one is they still got one hole to feel on the offensive line and everybody else. I feel good about, I really do. And they've gone all in on this season. It feels like it all has to come together for Ryan Day with a level of urgency I just don't feel anywhere else in the sport, and that includes the SEC. They got to have it. It's not just because they spent all this money on players. It's not just because this roster is ridiculous or you added Chip Kelly to the staff or Carlos Lachlan, for that matter. It is because you lost Michigan for three years in a row, okay? And frankly, I'm not in, a, in an alternate universe. Like, we're in Earth 616, right? Let's take it to 934. Let's make it... Let's we'll do the one where Robert Downey Jr. actually is doomed. I'm going to tell you, dog, Jim Harbaugh plays that game in 2020. We're not talking about this. We're just not, right? But the, he ate that contract, and he turned Michigan into the standard bearer in the Big Ten in uh, Ohio State. You just can't have that. You, you, you just can't have that. So they're all in on that. And as far as the rest of the league, right, I think you're talking about a two-team league. And that's one of the reasons I think you're going to see so many SEC teams and so many Big Ten teams, not just in my ranking, but all over, right? We all feel very strongly about the quality of football at the top in the Big Ten, the SEC. Where we get to be fun, right, is once we get past those teams that we're more or less predicting right now to be in the conference championships, right? Now, we probably need to touch on this, Dean, as it just happened. But when I did these rankings, right, C.J. Baxter had gone down, but I still felt good about the running back room. Now... We've got Christian Clark going down, and that might be an air raid offense if they can't pass pro. But, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself here. From your lips to God's ears, because I've been preaching that as well about Texas. And that is a real thing, especially if they're going to play as many games as you know. a lot of people, myself included, think that they're capable of this year. Uh, let's talk about LSU at seven. You have some serious faith in Garrett Nussmeyer if you're putting, if you're putting the Bayou Bengals that high. I do. I have some serious faith in pass protecting him, too. He's got two of the best offensive tackles in all of football. Full stop. Like, I was doing the list. Like, we're, we're, I'm working on another list. Like, rankings is, is the thing that I do at Fox. So, I'm working on the top 100. And I'm telling you, Will Camel 
and Emory Jones are right there. I just got to figure out where the hell it is that I'm going to put them. Outside of that, you're talking about perhaps Kelvin Banks um, or Jonah Arizona. There's a couple of other guys that I really like at that position, but he's got both. He's got two of them on either side. And if they're able to run the ball even a little bit, and Kyron Lacey is half as good as Malik Neighbors or Brian Thomas Jr. was, I know that Nuss is going to sling it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I have faith in that. And plus, I've, I've known Garrett Nussmeyer since he was in high school. He did the show before I got to Fox. And that was the one thing. It's like, no, I want to throw it deep. And then what did you see against Wisconsin? He threw it deep, and he led them to a win against a credible Big Ten team. I also think that their schedule is one in which we're going to get to see Garrett Nussmeyer shine. Because if they go and give the what for and the how now to SC, and he puts up Lincoln Riley quarterback numbers, everybody else is going to be on board with me too. I think that's fair. I, I and I'm not as high, quite as high in LSU, but I do think that there is a path for them to be just as good as they were last year. Obviously, the defensive just side. Put a lid on defense, right? Put a, put put a lid on the defense. That's yeah. Put a lid on the defense is something that I think LSU fans said on a weekly basis last year. Uh, maybe the first part of this year uh, to be determined on that. Alabama at nine. Only one AP voter had Bama lower than that, and it was tenth. What gives you the most concern about this team? It ain't Nick Saban, you know, like that's, that's in our sport, college football head coaches are the stars because we have so much turnover and change in this era. And while everybody else is clutching their pearls, I love chaos because I get to work in chaos, but people want to be anchored, right? And the thing that I said about the AP having them at number five is, are y'all giving this team the Nick Saban bounce? Because if you're looking at the roster, I don't think that that's a top five roster. And I don't know that anybody would really disagree with me on that. I think you got Jalen Milrow, who has the highest ceiling, I think, of any quarterback in all of college football. But it is still a guy that wants to throw the ball to the other team. And it's still a guy that doesn't want to throw an intermediate pass or one that we trust him to throw. And then you're going to have to run the ball with somebody new. I get you getting Caden Proctor back. But I'm also looking at two new coordinators. You know, Kane Womack we know about. Nick Sheridan we know about. But you're really just betting on Kalen DeBoer, which is – that's okay, right? That's a man that's won 104 games. He's lost 12. But as everybody wants to tell me as an Oklahoma guy, it's the SEC, right? And the SEC is different. So why are we treating Kalen DeBoer like he's coached there before rather than the guy they're going to rename the field after retired? And I want you to act like that happened. That's nine. That's not five, right? But that's also not out of the top 25. That's not out of the top 15. I don't really think it's that big of an overreaction. It's just going... I don't want to see it. I would like to see it. Go beat Wisconsin at Camp Randall. Take your bye week. Beat Georgia. And then we can talk. Until then, just show me something. I admit my faith in Alabama, having them at sixth in my preseason top 25, is very much baked in faith in Kalen DeBoer and Jalen Milrow, that they're just going to figure it out together. And you're right. I, I think you could look at the roster. You could find the holes in the defense. Saban himself has talked about the potential issues in the secondary and why he can't even put Bama in the SEC championship going into this season. But yeah, there's clearly some concerns. There'll be plenty of people that are a bit in wait and see mode with Alabama. Um, so we, those are kind of the main things that we actually like disagree on, I guess. But I got to say, RJ, like I look at this list and I, I feel like you and I align very strongly on the teams that I, I guess feel strongest about. I thought I was going to be highest on FSU by having them at, at seven. You have them at five. I thought I was going to be highest on Oklahoma by having them at 12. You have them at 11. I thought I was going to be lowest on Penn State by having them at 14. You also have them at 14. I thought I was going to be lowest on Clemson by having them at 20. You have them at 19. And then I thought I was going to be lowest on Miami by having them at 19. And you have them at 26. Pick any one of those teams. That's five teams right there. FSU, Oklahoma, Penn State, Clemson, Miami. Kind of polarizing teams in their own unique way heading into the season. But pick any one of those teams and sort of explain why you kind of zagged from the consensus. It's easy for me to go to Oklahoma. So I'm going to do that quickly, right? Why is it easy for you to go to Oklahoma, RJ? Hey, look, look here now. <laughs> look here now. Uh, for the folks that do not know, I am from the state of Oklahoma, and I went to grad school at the University of Oklahoma, and I went to undergrad at the University of Tulsa. But Oklahoma is the pro team, and that is how I got into this business. Like, I, I've been covering college football half my life. My first full-time beat writer job was covering that team and getting to know recruiting. And it got to be deeper than it being my team. It got to be a bunch of kiddos that I know. And then from eighth grade, all of a sudden, they're all juniors and seniors in college. And 2017 happens, and I'm doing this. But I talk a bunch about the Sooners because that's my squad, and I love them so much. That said, I 
it's getting under my skin in a way that I didn't expect it to. Just how people want to talk about Oklahoma having to play in the SEC as opposed to the SEC having to play Oklahoma. As if, I don't know, this is Central Florida or this is UTSA. You know, there, there's some legacy here and we got a history of beating up on SEC teams. Now, I know they're 0-3 in the college football playoff, but we beat Tennessee. We beat Auburn in the Sugar Bowl. We beat Nick State in Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. Right? We can keep going down the list on this one. So that's one. But it's also more about Brent Venables and what he has done with that staff and what he's done with that roster. He came to Oklahoma thinking he could do it the Clemson way. Turns out Dabo Sweeney's the only person who can still do it the Clemson way. Right? So he went to the portal, and he came out with some dudes. He took control of the defense. We go for six to seven, ten wins in the regular season. Okay, That's one. The second thing is, it ain't as if Brent came to Oklahoma to not win. And certainly, he ain't come to be eight and four. He ain't come to be uh, eight. Uh, excuse me, seven and five. He came to win, right? Now he's people are going. He's severe. And I'm going. You don't. You don't know severe yet. That's a man that still wakes up in the morning to go run stadium stairs at Memorial Stadium at his age, doing his job. I have tremendous faith in the offensive line because of the offensive line coach Bill Biedenboe, who just puts first round picks into the NFL. They're going to be deep at wide receiver, if not great. They're good enough at tailback, and then if Jackson Arnold can develop into the kind of prospect we think he is, you're going to be fine. And then I love that defense, man. I love Billy Bowman. I love Peyton Bowen. I know oh man, Ethan Downs, Danny Stutzman. There's a squad there. So that's why I got him at 11. The other one that I, I think I'm getting a lot of hell for, well, maybe not hell. People just want to know. Florida State at five. Connor, I got here because I'm equally balanced. I got chips on both shoulders, you know. Uh, and I can't think of a reason to be more aggrieved and to be more pissed than if I'm a Florida State football player. Because you lied to me. You told me that if I won every game I played in a power conference, I'm playing in the college football playoff. And you took that from me. You took that from me because you didn't like the look of the roster, not what we did on a football field. And then Mike Norvell, who had to tell his kids that, goes into the portal and says, you know what, let me go get enough of these dudes so we can leave no doubt. I'm going to turn DJ Uyunglele into a player. That, by the way, Goodness me, if that dude can be the guy we thought he was going to be, they're in high cotton over there. I get that they're changing over the offense. I get that the, the defense is not got Jerry Verse on it, but it's got Patrick Payton. And anybody who's seen him play knows what you're doing here. Same thing with Fentrell Cypress. I can make an argument that they get past SMU, right? They're expected to beat them, but SMU is a good football team. You get to Notre, uh, Notre Dame on November 9th. You're, that's a play-in game. And they can afford to lose one and still make the 12-team playoff, right? It's not the four anymore. I like them at five. I think they're the best team in the ACC. We know that that's an automatic qualifying spot, which means they'll probably be one of the highest-ranked teams as, as a group uh, power four champion. I just don't think that Miami or Clemson at this moment has what it takes to go knock them off and get them into that playoff and then let them cook. You made the exact case that I feel like I've been making – throughout the offseason with Florida State. And they're a team that I admittedly have done a 180 on because of specifically what Norvell has done in the portal. There are certain coaches that deserve blind faith. There are certain coaches who need to earn that blind faith. And I think Norvell has already earned that blind faith with what he's been able to do. Uh, you, go, you go back to the Venables thing. I actually had someone tell me uh, about a month ago that they were at Clemson. And they're like, who is that guy over there? And they're like, oh, my God, that's Brent Venables running stadiums back at Clemson. Like, that's just the way that he's wired. And he is, I think, very unique in how long he waited for this opportunity. And there are people in the SEC who looked at that initial contract extension and rightfully kind of had an eyebrow an eyebrow raise to it, being like, wait, well, wait a minute. You haven't lived up to the pre, uh, you know, I guess the, the first 20 years of the 21st century Oklahoma standard, whatever you want to call that, whatever you think that is, he hasn't necessarily earned that just yet. But where are you at with 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 him overall as, as a guy that could take that next step? Maybe that's that's a guy that we're not talking about enough as being someone that can put it all together, because the range of outcomes that I see with him feels like it's all over the place. A couple things. The first is when Lincoln Riley said he was going to USC, the first tweet I sent was Oklahoma head coach Brent Venables. OK, uh, that man not only knows Oklahoma, but he went to Clemson, beat the hell out of us, won two national championships. And all we're going is, ah, because we want you know, we love an offense, but everybody loves a defense We're football is about being tough and defense is tough. There's that. The second part of that is. You know, Kirby Smart was waiting on one job to open up for him. It's a good point. You know, good point. 
And it, it was the one place he wanted to go home to, and he got an early extension. People forget about that. And they hadn't won a national championship. Look, I think the same trajectory is where Brent Venables is headed. I think he's about to go into one of the coolest parts of his coaching career. And that contract extension is about stability as much as anything else. But I think that Oklahoma looked at him the way that Georgia looks at Kirby Smart. Now, will we get the same returns? We'll see, right? But right now, it's really difficult to feel bad about Oklahoma and not feel like you're about to walk into a league where if you go beat people, that will be respected. And that's what Brent Venables is also chasing. Because even at Clemson, we would say, it's the ACC, y'all are going to beat up on the ACC, and then they go and beat the brakes off of Bama 44-16, and we get to start thinking about them like an SEC program, right? Oklahoma gets skipped that step because they're already in the SEC, or at least that's how I see it. How would Dion feel about Colorado being ranked number 41 by you? Probably say I'm not there. You know, that's probably what he would say because, hell, 99% of us aren't there. But if you're looking at that and you're expecting me to tell you that they are a upper echelon Big 12 team, I can get to five. I can get to five, right? But the teams in front of them are all really, really good, and that's a really, really deep league. I also think that it's room for them to grow, right? Like, I was way ahead on them last year, okay? By the time they got to the conference play, you got two things. One, you don't have depth on defense and defensive line. And two, you don't have an offensive line. But they were able to make that work for four games, give or take, right? Because depending on how you want to feel about SC. Because I thought that they actually played pretty well in that game. They just, they got outclassed. If the offensive line is what they're claiming it's going to be, they'll move up. But I've been down this before. And one of the things that I don't do is act like last year doesn't matter. When I was picking them, Jackson State was where they were coming from, and I saw the portal. I'm going, okay, I like some of this. I didn't know anything about the offensive line. Nobody really did. Now we know more about what that program is about, and we know who the stars are. They're not sneaking up on anybody this year. So I think they're in a good spot. I I think I've got them behind Memphis at 40, and Memphis, that's a damn good football team. If you put Memphis up against Colorado, who's going to win? I would flip a coin. I really would. You know, that's how I feel about him. So how would how would Prime feel? I mean, maybe Prime thinks they're a top 25 team. I don't know. I know he's got two players that are going to get drafted in the first round. And usually, we expect that program to be a top 25 team. We'll see if they can get there. RJ, you have no idea, but I was actually just about to ask you about Memphis and about the group of five as a whole, which is kind of crazy. I'm like, wait a minute. He just, he just brought up Memphis as the team that, that we're talking about side by side with Colorado. As a fan of this sport, I find myself worried about the future of the group of five because I think you could look at rankings all over the place. Your rankings reflect that. The AP poll reflects that. I remember looking at, at Schleybaugh's ranking on, rankings on ESPN.com post-spring, and they didn't have any group of five teams in there. But Memphis is your highest-ranked group of five team at 37, and that's behind 10 Big Ten teams and 11 SEC teams. And I think Memphis is going to get the group of five bid to get into the 12 team playoff. So I would agree with you that I think they are the best of the, of the group of five, but man, I I feel like the group of five desperately needs to pull off a miracle and win a playoff game in the first or second year. Otherwise this disrespect that they get perceived disrespect, whatever you want to call it, but it's not going to get any better and it's going to keep getting tougher and tougher to make the case for teams like this. How difficult was it to finally get to that first one where you're like, all right, I'm at 37. I got to put a group of five team in here eventually. Well, actually, I, I, it wasn't that difficult because that didn't figure into the philosophy, right? What figured in was national championships, conference championships, roster management, how your administration figures into what you're doing. Like Troy, Troy Dannon not being at Washington, being at Nebraska, figures into both of those for me, right? I'm also looking at this from the standpoint of which one of these G5 programs doesn't act like one. And when you get $25 million from FedEx just to go pay players, you're not acting like a group of five programs. As a matter of fact, now that I'm thinking about it, the one that I circled on Florida State was Memphis. Like, that's that's the game. That's the one that they ought to be really loaded up for because that's a great trap game for Memphis. Like, they're going to have them at a really good spot. The Bowl. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, the reunion And Silverfield knows, I mean, that that was his defensive coordinator, right? Right. Uh, Ryan Silverfield. And I've been out to Memphis a couple times the last two years, and I got to tell you, they they love that program too, right? They they're proud of it. That figures, right? If SMU was still in the group of five, they'd probably be in that spot. But I actually, I went through Memphis, I went through Appalachian State, I went through UTSA, and I went through Texas State. 
And I had to do some shuffling when we're talking about those programs. But again, I went to undergrad at a group of five program. And when I was in school, you know, 2006 to 2010, we were damn good. We, we were damn good. And, you know, we weren't ever thinking about, man, making the playoff or even win a national championship. We wanted respect. And I think if that's what you're chasing as an athletic program, this isn't going to get under your skin. You're not going to get worried about this. It's going to fall where it falls. But if you want to be all in on football, nobody's going to stop you. And that's where I'm at. Like, put it another way. In the state of Tennessee, there is one program that doesn't act like they want to do this at all. Okay? That's Vanderbilt. Why do we keep talking about Memphis and the group of five when we need to be talking about places like Vanderbilt and go, do you want to play football? Because if you don't, there's a lot of people that do. So let's spread the wealth just a little bit differently. And that's one of the other reasons I really like name, image, and likeness is you get these donors that went to schools like mine or went to schools like Memphis go, hell with it then. Let, let's go. Let's get it. Because I think that right now is a really interesting time. Connor, you might be paying attention to this like I am. Which program? have their NIL collectives under thumb, under manners, and in control. Missouri. Holy smokes. What do we think about Missouri? That's a damn good football team. Ohio State, damn good football team. Georgia, damn good football team. You keep going down the line, it lines up right where you think it should based on who wants to be all in on football. And now you've given people like myself a market inefficiency to exploit, and that's what they're doing. They said, hey, Fred, we got, a, we got a chance here. We got a chance to go make some noise. Here's $25 million. What? You know, you try doing that anywhere else, even at a Power 4 school, you're going to get pushback. You really are. Like, I'm thinking, okay, Louisville, what's your excuse? Okay, Virginia, what's your excuse? Or what, would, what would Thomas Jefferson say if y'all can't win no football games? But if that's not where your brain is, then that's, that's how I'm going to rank you, too. You know, like I, I want to be about football players and football coaches that want to go win. And I think Memphis and a few of these other group of five programs that I mentioned, they measure up. They really do. Alignment is everything, especially the group of five. It, it, it's so, so unbelievably important. And if you don't have it, man, just just forget about it in this day and age. It is just so difficult. To, it's going to be moving forward to be able to win football games. Uh, who did you get maybe the most pushback on? Maybe a team that we haven't talked about yet, a team that like their fans really kind of chirped you. They saw the rankings. I don't know if you read there. You got like 350 comments or something like that on the on the initial tweet. So I'm sure there were there were plenty that were uh, living in your mentions. Maybe somebody like sent you a note saying like, RJ, what are, what are we doing here, man? Let's uh, let, let's let's make sure that we get right. And let's make sure that you're noticing us. Well, one, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna going to respond to a few of these. So please uh, send me what you think. But I, I say this to anybody, and I've gone back to my radio days in Tulsa, where I was doing nine to eleven. The show was called Fight Me, right? Because I'm backgrounds in rhetoric, right? My backgrounds in debate and dialogue. But it is build an argument. This ain't your daddy's Facebook page, okay? I don't want to hear why did what my my team is better than this. Tell me why. Give me the why. Or when you tell me somebody's going to go 11 and 2, tell me who the losses are. You know, you're going to go 9 and 4 or 9 and 4, tell me which bowl game they lost in. You know, or what what four losses they got. So, when I look at this, I'm always curious about who builds an argument and who doesn't. But who I've heard the loudest from is actually Washington fans. Mm. And and they are like a few of them I uh, are despondent and I'm going, "Yeah, I kind of would be too because it's not every day that I mean, it, I say not every day. That's becoming the, the, the norm, I think. That's the new normal we're going to have to get used to. We're going to see a Texas Christian or Washington get to a national championship game and not be the same next year because somebody's going to raid them or some coach is going to take another job. But I think we're going to see more stories like Texas Christian and more stories like Washington. And now if you're smart about this, meaning athletic departments and name, image, and likeness, you start locking up people in October. When you, go, when you get to bowl eligibility in October, you need to make sure that 2025 is still the same damn team that you got now, right? I think that part is going to change. But Washington lost damn near everybody on that football team and the athletic director. Like, I, I've never seen that before. I've never seen an athletic director, a head coach, star players all leave to go do something in college, right? Like, I'm, I mean, we could talk about, we could talk a little bit about how Kalen DeBoer worked out, right, at Alabama, and who's going to say no to that? But the rest of this is you went and hired a guy that also just got done telling everybody he's not going anywhere. We, so, so what are we to believe on this? And we want to let it go when coaches tell us, well, you know, I'm not going anywhere, and then they go somewhere, but we want to hold it against kids. 
I think that stuff translates. I think if you can't put down roots anywhere, why would I trust you to put down roots at this place and turn it into a winner? You know, you got Will Rogers. I like Will Rogers, but I know Will Rogers from having all that time at Mississippi State. You know, not that time at Washington. And you're going to start, I think, I think they got two returning starters on the roster, but only one of them is going to start. So they're going to be 21 across the board. And you hired Brennan Carroll, who I think has earned his reputation, honestly. What he did with Arizona is ridiculous. Noah Fafita, oh my God, man, and McMillan. That, that, studs. But you hired a Belichick that you still got to convince people about. Not, I, I would say you hired the other Belichick, right? And if it works out, it works out. But if you're selling the NFL, Connor, who the hell in college football ain't selling the NFL? Like, when you tell me, we built this like an NFL franchise. So? You know, like, like who, who doesn't do that? And you're going into a conference that is top to bottom damn good. Like, I, you'll notice I got Rutgers way out in front of Washington because we know what Rutgers is about. And by the way, Greg Schiano got up there and started talking about I came to win championships. I would love to hear that from Washington in year one, but I don't. So I'm asking Washington fans, if you got something that I don't know about, tell me what it is. I think that this is probably the first time anybody has dropped a team that was just playing a national championship as far off in the, the, the whatever the, the conversation is next year in the way that Washington has been dropped off. Because you have them at 83 in your rankings. And I looked at that. I'm like, yeah, that feels low, but... Then you kind of look at all the different all the different new pieces, and you're like, it's just it's different. Even last year when TCU, I felt like I was banging the drum that TCU needed to be ranked higher. They needed to start off in like the top. I think I had them at like 16 or 17. Everybody's telling me all what they lost. They didn't have the coaching changes nearly at the level that Washington is dealing with. And when you have that, and then you combine it with the 30 day window and all these other things, and the fact that like all these guys were just waiting to go to the NFL. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to to take anything from last year into that preseason ranking. So, I yeah, it's probably it's lower than when, where I would have had him just because I like get Jed Fish and I think he's awesome. But at the same time, man, like I can't I can't sit here and even make the case for it. And that's that's a, that's the good point is like, pitch me, give give me why your team is that much better. And people probably can't really do that with that team. And I, I don't I don't really expect anybody to to do it. But when you do say something to me. I'm going to take you at your word, right? And to the point about Washington also, I got Jacksonville State as an example ranked ahead of them. If they play head up, Washington probably wins, but they don't play head up. And who's going to finish ahead of each other, right? Like Jacksonville State's got a better shot to win their conference championship than Washington, which means that Jacksonville State has a better opportunity to win the national championship than Washington because they'll qualify for the playoff and Washington won't. If you don't see the logic in that, I can't, I can't help you, right? Um, that's how I put these things together. Not, not for nothing. You're going, uh, you, you said uh, you haven't seen anybody drop them that low. I'm like, who, who ranks 134 teams and writes something sure. about each and every one of them, dog? Like, I, sure. I, I'm just saying, like, give me, give me some credit on that. Yeah, no, you deserve it. You deserve it because there's a lot of like work that goes into this. I stopped at 25. I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe I'll throw in like another receiving votes thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm good. Let's, let, let's cut it off there. Uh, let's close with uh, just your, your fire off season take. Maybe the, the boldest prediction that you've had it can be something that we've already talked about in this interview, but the, the thing that you feel like is, is the spiciest thing that's been on your mind, a prediction for, for the upcoming season. The spiciest thing that is on my mind. We're not going to stop at 12 teams. We're going to 16. We're going to see how much. That's not is. spicy. That's we're getting there. We're getting it, there so it's soon. It's not, it's not. Okay. Well, I get, I get, Okay, let me let me walk that out. Maybe it's because whenever I say 16 teams, all anybody wants to yell back is it's too many. Six, 12, whatever, right? 14 was even a thought. So, all right, I'll put that one down because I love that one. Ryan Day wins a national championship. I don't think and that's spicy not either. Third base. Like that, is it? I mean, is that spicy? Oh, okay, uh, here's one. Here's one. Um Texas is going to make the playoff knowing that their running back room is still not what their running back room was going to be going in the season. And Michigan will not. Right? How about that? I mean, uh, talking about national championships, I'm thinking about this. And again, hope. I want to talk. I, I really want to lean into saying something positive about people, but all the things going on around Michigan, the turnover at that program, I want to see if it's just something they got. Because every time I think that it should affect them, whatever's going on off the field, the kids just don't care, but I don't, I don't think this is the year that they make the playoff 
given everything that's going on around them and the roster, right? Would you expect a defending national champion who ran the table, who hadn't lost at home since 2020, to not make a 12-team playoff plan in the Big Ten with the, with the background of a Michigan? I don't think so, right? But that's what I'm doing here because I, I really can't make that work. Because you, you put Ohio State, Oregon in there, and then who's your third team? That's the question. Who's your Iowa. third team in the Big Ten? Iowa. Iowa. That's my fire take, probably. <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> what, do you, what do you know about the offense? Like, that's... <laughs> It just can't be worse, man. It just can't okay. be worse. And okay. I saw the scrimmage numbers. I saw the scrimmage numbers. I dry heaved a little bit. I, I told myself, Connor, you're going to look like the biggest idiot in the world. But the team last year won 10 games with an offense that, that, that that's good, that's just was so historically bad. Bottom two in the country. It just I, has to be better. I was, I was curious about this because I wrote about them that I have them as a top 25 team, right? You, you know this. And I'm going just – Put an offense out there that doesn't embarrass your fans. That that's it. Because Phil Parker and that defense, they're going to make it happen. Like that, that's been one of the coolest uh, coaching stories of the last three years for me. And when that dude won the Broyles Award, um, I get to vote on the Broyles Award, and that's really cool to me, right? Because there's only about I want to say 24 of us, but I was stomping on the table for two years, going, "When are we going to give this trophy to Phil Parker?" And I think it worked out last year because Michigan and the sign stealing and stuff, and people felt some kind of way, but even so, I was like, you do what he did and put that entire team on your back because that's what they did. Uh, you deserve to be the top assistant coach in all of football, but the way I get at this is Kirk Ferentz, January, hire Tim Lester. And we're at asking about the offense. People ask about the offense, throwing the ball, modernizing the offense is what they say. You know, this thing called the forward pass. Heard and, of it. You're right. And Kirk says, you know, I know a little bit about coaching football. I won a bunch of games and he's right. You know, he's, when we're talking about guys that are going to get you eight, nine wins every year, he, he's there. That's, that's him. He also said, we got away from, you know, taking care of the football, running the football, and I think it was 2009. But we're not doing that ever again. I went and go look this team up. It's got Ricky Stanzi as the quarterback, and that was the best damn Iowa team not to win. A Tony Moyaki was on that team. And I'm going, yeah. okay, Kurt, this, that's just who you are, dog. Okay, uh, if you're going to be that way full time, then I'm just going to let it go. Because you're bringing up a guy that threw, I think he threw something like 12 picks, and I'm sure that drove Kirk crazy. But they were really good, and they were really fun. And I don't think he wants to live that way. I think he wants to punt the ball and say, I would rather punt the ball away than risk it throwing the biscuit. <laughs> we could be Ricky here talking about that all day, I swear. I, it's one of my funny, funny and favorite stories is just how Iowa remains Iowa, despite all this other change. Ricky Stanzi, uh, America, love it or leave it. He famously said, who could ever forget it? All-time quote, all-time quote in a postgame. On Fox's airwaves, I believe that was. Perfect way to be able to tie. Chris Myers on the podium with him. Yeah, who could forget it? Classic Orange Bowl moment. Um, <laughs> RJ, this has been a lot of fun, man. Uh, like I said before, foxsports.com. Check out all of RJ's rankings with explanations as well for these teams. He makes the case or just, just getting his mentions, uh, tweet at him, uh, do whatever you can to maybe maybe be able to make your case why your team is underrated. Uh, we'll do this again soon, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Connor. Appreciate you having me.